Okay. Welcome back, everyone. It's good to see you all today. Um, we're really excited about today's talk, and we're joined by um, Professor Matt Garcia from Dartmouth. And I'm going to introduce Professor Garcia in, a, in about a minute here. I just wanted to take a couple of um, minutes beforehand to do a couple of things, including framing framing the day and how it connects to tomorrow. Um, so the, the first thing is the, the sign-in sheet. So as we said yesterday, uh, the sign-in of the attendance is really important for us because this is a, a grant that we got and we want to show that we're, we're uh, serving a, a big part of our community with, this, uh, with the grant that we got. And so signing in is proof to our funders that, uh, that we had a big impact with this, this work. Um, the second thing is, um, to keep in mind that today is, is going to be more of a presentation um, lecture format. So um, if you're a student here and you want to take notes or your teacher has asked you to take notes, then it would be a good time to either have some paper out or opening up, an, uh, maybe open up another window on your, your uh, tablet or computer so you can jot down some notes. Um, or just kind of sit back and relax and, and learn. I think that's uh, often our preferred way of learning. However, I will say this, on Friday, uh, we are going to, to have our final session and there we're gonna talk about um, ending our journey with a cookbook, with creating a, a cookbook that represents your family recipes and your culture. And one of the things that we're gonna ask you to consider as we start to put some of those pieces together is what we've learned from our, from our guest speakers, um, Professor Garcia, and then tomorrow's guest speaker, David Bacon. So you might want to jot down a quote that resonates with you or two today, um, and the same for tomorrow. And then hold on to those quotes because we might return to them on, on Friday. Um, th that being said, um, this talk is really going to pick up where we left off yesterday. We're talking about avocado and citrus, and we started to talk about their journey sort of on a big scale. In terms of country and origin, we're really going to look at that journey as it relates to our borders, um, <clears throat> in particular the border between uh, Mexico and the United States. And so this is really a good good way to kind of continue this conversation, or the way that Tani framed it uh, yesterday, this journey um, from from uh, farm labor to family table. Uh, family table. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our our uh, guest speaker today. And our guest speaker is uh, Professor Matt Garcia. And Matt Garcia is obsessed with two things. He's obsessed with where food comes from and how the people involved in its production were treated. Um, the fascination with this topic comes from his family experience in food production. Um, and that spans three generations um, in working in California. On his mother's side, um, his grandfather earned his living working as a white collar data analyst for uh, Sunkist, which as we know, it's the big citrus company. Um, and then on his uh, father's side, his Mexican grandparents, the Garcia side, uh, were uh, field workers and picked fruit that Sunkist sold. Uh, so an interesting connection there between the family sides. Matt is also fascinated by the movements of hope that grow out of inequality, exploitation, and moments of conflict in rural California. At root, his work seeks to understand who we are as a society by knowing how we feed ourselves. Um, Matt received his PhD from the Claremont Graduate School in 1997. Since then, he has taught at the University of Illinois Ur Urbana-Champaign, the University of Oregon, Brown University, and he served as the director of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Currently, he is the professor of Latin American Latino and Caribbean studies and history at Dartmouth College. <clears throat> and also before he takes it from here, his research uh, in a book that he wrote, A World of Its Own, inspired a lesson that we created looking at the development of East Side um, rock and roll music, or as we call in our, the Chicano community, oldies. And uh, we created a lesson for teachers to teach their students about how this music was formed and how it actually represents some uh, resistance on the part of youth living in East LA in the San Diego Real Valley. So we're gonna drop the link in the chat for you all to access. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to, to Matt. Let's give him a round of applause by either clapping <laughs> or doing the clap emoji. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, thank you. It's nice to be back in Southern California. Um, I want to thank Danny and Tawny um, they've been such gracious hosts. Uh, I want to thank UCLA and La Plaza 
Um, and uh, I also want to acknowledge the Abenaki people uh, whose land I am um, speaking from right now uh, in New England. And um, I think it's always important to do a land acknowledgement. So thank you to the Abenaki for allowing me to have a place at Dartmouth um, and uh, to do this work. Um, so many years ago, um, I published that book that Danny talked about. And then I uh, eventually published a book about the United Farm Workers. Um, but in the process of, of doing this work, um, I met lots of really important people that were doing food uh, studies, including Melanie Dupuy and Don Mitchell, who were kind of co-travelers that were exploring the same questions. And we were essentially asking a question that's been asked many times before, and that is, um, are you what you eat, right? And really the, the answer to that question is yes, um, but it, it needs to be, I think, um, interrogated a bit because what we eat today depends on foods that cross borders or people that cross borders to produce that food, right? And so that was a question that we didn't have an easy answer to because we were uncomfortable with what we were finding in terms of how farm workers were treated, particularly in Mexico. And then we know historically the ways in which farm workers are treated in the United States. So it led to this really important project that has actually taken on a life of its own and is taught across the country now called Food Across Borders, where um, we asked the question, you know, what, what are the consequences of um, answering that answer? We are who we, we are what we eat if that food comes from people um, that cross the border or foods that cross that border. And I wanna just introduce to you uh, Let's see, it's not advancing, there we go. Um, the kind of undergirding um, political theory uh, beneath this, which comes from all the way back from the 17th century and Thomas Hobbes who published a book called Leviathan. And he's reflecting um, on the notion of the body politic, the ways in which um, a, the governed uh, assign legitimacy and authenticity to those that govern them. At, at that point in time, He's talking about a monarchy, but um, he's acknowledging that the king doesn't rule by divine right, but it's a social contract between the individuals and that that uh, sovereign. So you see in this picture, you actually see it made uh, the, the 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 king made up of of individuals, and it's a kind of visual manifestation of the contract. So one of the things that um, a government does, whether it's a a monarchy or it's a democracy like ourselves. This essential function, one of its essential functions is to provide um, access to sustenance or food. So a, a government or a society that can't feed itself doesn't live long, doesn't it doesn't um, succeed. Um, and this gave rise to the notions of cuisine, um, particularly in the 17th, 18th century. Um, and essentially these are the things that make people a people. So if you think about it, there's French cuisine, right? That is known as sophisticated. And they, they often have these markers that go with them that are hierarchical, um, somewhat problematic, can be discriminatory even. So Mexican food is often seen as earthy or Thai food exotic or soul food associated with black people, um, uh, Southern black people as comfort food, right? So as I said, in the worst cases, um, we won't go into that. Um, it can be discriminatory, but in the best case for the people that eat that food, right, depend on that food, identify with that food, it makes them feel connected to their culture and in times, uh, at times connected to a place, um, especially when those people are mobile, such as um, African-Americans that move to the North that ate soul food in places like Detroit and Chicago. Um, but that's af absolutely true for uh, Latinos that leave their homes in Central America or Mexico and come here and reconstitute a cuisine that makes them feel whole and gives them a kind of connectedness to the places they come from. Um, so that's my story, basically. I mean, Danny laid it out there, but I wanna lay it out a little bit more clearly. Um, I come from people that cross borders and in fact, my legacy, uh, if you will, this is in the title of um, the entire program, um, the legacy of how food connects us. Well, food connects me to you, me to Los Angeles, me to the place of my origins. And 
by and through that connection, I'm connected to Mexico, which is where um, Daniel Martinez, who's there in the middle, um, started. He he migrated from Michoacan in the um, beginning of the 20th century. He came and 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 settled um, in downtown LA and started a carniceria, which is a meat market. And um, he had to close that shop in the depression. Um, and because of that, his daughter, his eldest, the matriarch of my family, uh, Cheva Garcia, there's a young Cheva um, picking crops and then an older Cheva with my father and me, um, who went on the migrant trail as so many Mexican people did in the 1930s and picked fruit and was uh, very much active in that world. My father ended up following in his great grandfather's uh, steps and uh, owning a carnaceria in Azusa. Um, and that's where I learned how to uh, cut meat and to um, be someone that produced food. And now today I'm running a sustainable um, a regenerative agricultural um, farm in, in um, uh, Vermont where I raise beef and chickens and, and cows. Um, and uh, I feel very connected um, to my family. And in fact, my grandmother who's 96 today still calls me and talks to me about butchery and talks to me about the cows and talks to me about the recipes and I make, you know, uh, abondigas and I make all these things that my grandmother sort of made for me when I was a, a young man growing up and getting educated in Southern California. And so I feel very connected by food, food production and the farm work that kind of makes our family and it's my legacy. And I think it's an illustration of the things that um, uh, bind a people they can bind a people in terms of cuisine, but they can bind a family and bind a community. So when I was working with my father in the 1990s, I was uh, traveling to the LA wholesale market with him. And um, we encountered just an amazing uh, abundance of uh, tropical fruits and, and, and foods that changed seemingly every year in the 80s and 90s as we went to this uh, wholesale market in downtown LA from Azusa. We'd get uh, in the, the van around 3.30, we'd hit there and we would buy all of these fruits and vegetables. Um, and increasingly what we saw is um, fruits and vegetables that had not been there the year before. And that was in reflection of the kind of immigration that was happening in LA and the LA suburbs during that time. So it, it's important to note, yes, avocados really became a thing at this time. Um, we've now become accustomed to it being um, a, a necessary uh, ingredient for guacamole during Super Bowl Sundays. Um, and it was this period in which it's really booming and it's because of this connection and because of this community. But the interesting thing was mangoes. Mangoes had not been really a kind of um, daily, uh, uh, consumption product or, or, or um, produce um, until many, many Latinos started moving to um, Southern California and to the United States. Um, only one third of Euro-Americans had ever purchased the fruit uh, in um, the 1990s when I was uh, going with my father. So that meant that half of all mangoes that were exported from Mexico were consumed in Los Angeles by predominantly immigrants. And this kind of tells the story of how um, a nation's and a, and a community's um, cuisine changes because of immigration. And it actually is made more interesting, more tasteful, and more, uh, uh, more connected in many ways to the places of um, the current inhabitants' uh, origins. So this, this place kind of educated me and, and excited me to study this topic. And so, uh, mangoes, of course, are critical to Latino food, um, but it is also a very important uh, uh, contributor to the other big fad that's growing in the late 2000s, uh, or early 2000s, late um, 20th century, which is Thai food. Um, and so in that book, uh, uh, Food Across Borders, we explore the ways in which Asian food, and Thai in particular, um, comes to define a people and a place and a cuisine in Southern California. And so the, the profile, the flavor, flavor, flavor profile is known as yum, which is a salty, sour, sweet, creamy, and spicy combination. And it depends on all of those uh, uh, ingredients that are coming from across the border. Initially, it would come in 
um, through Asian markets, um, such as this one here in um, North Hollywood, um, which is Bangkok market. Um, but be before Bangkok market, it was mostly Chinese markets that had existed for a very long time, had connections to the products in, in, in Asia. Um, with the owner of the Bangkok market, it, who started in Hollywood in 1971, which is the center of the Thai community, this was uh, Pramorte uh, Tilamonko. Uh, Tilamonko was someone who said, I, I don't like paying all of these uh, exorbitant um, communication or, or transportation costs to bring in these exotic uh, um, ingredients that are necessary to have this yum profile, this this tasty profile. And so he started to, um, there's Bangkok market. He started to turn to the gifts of free trade. Now we think of free trade and I'm gonna get into it as a kind of negative. It's a, uh, it undermined local economies. Um, it displaced uh, many of the immigrants that came to uh, Southern California and eventually throughout the United States. And I'll get to that story in the second half, but one of the things that I think we need to reckon with is that free trade also uh, has a kind of Janus face. And, and, and I wanna start with the kind of positive ways in which entrepreneurs like uh, Tillamunkel or even my father um, were able to exercise um, a kind of uh, free market logic uh, under free trade that was essentially managing um, a situation that was handed to them not one of their own making, but they made, uh, as they say, lemonade out of lemons, right? So what's amazing about Tillamunkel is that in order to find those ingredients at a much more affordable cost for their working class customers, um, they could no longer keep trying to get them from Asia, um, but they started to search for them locally. What's interesting is the, the kefir uh, leaf, which is a uh, citrus leaf, very important in Thai food. They initially went out to Riverside, California, where there's a citrus station, and they would sneak into the citrus station and uh, uh, essentially steal these kefir uh, leaves. But eventually, um, they knew they needed something more reliable, and it was actually under free trade and NAFTA that they were able to set up a network of um, farms in Sinaloa and Nayarit, and uh, also parts of Baja California that were able to grow the very specific uh, um, ingredients that Thai people and Asian immigrants more generally really came to depend on. And I would just talk about, I mean, in terms of, of a Bangkok market, I would say there were many different markets like this. My father's in the market was like this in many ways where we started getting um, uh, fruits and vegetables. We got dragon fruit um, from the LA market that became available largely because the immigration that was coming to Southern California redefined what it meant to be an Angelino in that time, right? And so ultimately what was key to our success, to Tillamunkel's success, was the ability to access food grown by people on the other side of the border, right? So in many ways, um, free trade has this uh, effect of creating the opportunity or um, the accessibility of food that makes a community whole, right? And um, I think that that is a, a, a something that's often left out of stories of NAFTA and, and free trade. Now there's the other side of it, right? Um, and I wanna turn and, and allow you to think about the foods that make you whole or make you, give you what you need to be uh, you, in other words. What foods do I need to make me, me? For me, moving to Vermont and, and uh, uh, Dartmouth, um, I was very far away from the foods that make me whole. And so I ultimately started growing um, my own meat uh, or raising my own meat. Uh, in part to have things like oxtail or to cook a pig's head or do all of these things that my grandmother brought me up to, to do and to um, affirm my identity, right? And in many ways, I am very privileged to be able to do that because uh, I have uh, scaled 
the mountain of uh, academic uh, hierarchies. I'm at Dartmouth. I'm well paid. I'm able to have time to farm and I've tried to turn that into um, a kind of practice that I want people to see as a model for feeding oneself. Um, I'm engaged in regenerative agriculture. I do um, grazing that actually uh, reduces the amount of CO2 in the air as opposed to um, contributing to ozone depletion, right? But I recognize that that is um, a privilege and it is something that not everybody can do, right? So in most cases, right, and this is part of the kind of valorization of, of local foods and what we were um, in some ways challenging with food across borders. Because at the time of food across borders, there was, and still to some extent uh, is, a celebration of eating local, which I very much uh, agree with. But eating local means you're eating um, very expensive food, right? Um, so most people depend on the food that comes by way of that LA wholesale market. And there's wholesale markets all over the United States. It's not just in Los Angeles. And that food is often produced through conventional agriculture, not the kind of regen regenerative agriculture that I'm practicing or that is celebrated in farmers markets today. And for the most part, working class people, immigrant people, mobile people get their identity by eating foods that pass through other hands and often pass across a border, right? So I think the question that, that uh, we started with with, this, with that book still remains and is actually even more true today. And I wanna challenge you to think about it as well. How do I make sure that my identity, if your identity is wrapped in what you, you eat, how does my identity, how does, uh, do I make sure that my identity doesn't come at the expense of someone's dignity, right? In the era of free trade, in the era of NAFTA, which I'll explore in the second half, there were conditions close to slavery found in uh, the United States, right? That was providing some of those uh, necessary uh, food items. In Mexico, there was actual slavery. And I think David Bacon, who will speak tomorrow, will actually highlight this, right? So as a conscientious consumer, we need to grapple with that issue. And uh, our food practices, while they define us as a culture and as a people and as an individual, sometimes come at, at the expense of the dignity of workers in that world. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna leave that as a breakout question. And then I'm gonna explore the darker side of NAFTA and to explore some organizations that are helping to answer that question, both for me locally, and I think more generally nationally as well, which I hope leaves you with a sense of what can you do and what can we do to make sure that we don't sacrifice uh, workers' dignity to have the foods we need. So I'll let you, Danny, take over and yeah. do the breakout. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so uh, as you heard, we're gonna have a breakout room session. We're gonna keep them small so it has a chance for you all to kind of get to know each other and, and chat. So just like yesterday, quick introductions. And then there's two questions, right? And so the first one is uh, what Matt was talking about. What is that food or foods that make you you, right? Like you, you couldn't live without these. It would have a sort of like psychological uh, impact on you. And then the other question is a big one, right? And it's one that we're really going to grapple with uh, the second part of this talk and throughout the week. And so if you're not sure how to approach that second question, one thing to consider is, well, what do I need to start asking myself about the food that I eat? What questions do I need to ask in order to start to think about uh, the dignity of those who are producing the food and picking the food? What questions should I be asking about these meals that I'm eating? So that's one way to approach the question um, that you might find helpful. So I'm thinking about five minutes. Uh, Matt, does that sound about right? Does that yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So we'll do, we'll have uh, five minutes for breakout to have these, these very quick discussions, and then we'll rejoin and we'll hear the second part of this talk. Might you have any questions about, about what we're going to be doing? I'm using my teacher pause. 
All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into those breakout rooms. You'll see a prompt show up and uh, from there you'll be taken to your room. Hi, everyone. Hi. How do you pronounce your name? Like, is it Akin? Uh, it's Akin Mensa. Like, Akin Mensa. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Do you want to do you want to start us off about what kind of food makes you you? I guess so. Like, I enjoy eating like plantains, like mm -hmm. fried, baked. It doesn't really matter. Like, stews soups like uh there's this thing native to my culture it's called jollof rice it's like a special way they make the rice oh. it's kind of like orange rice in the mexican culture but like it it tastes different but it looks similar what's your what's the culture that you identify with i'm um, Ghanaian american oh cool yeah i think for me the foods that make me me well so I lived I moved abroad for many years I, I moved to Scotland where the food is really different and for me the foods that made me me were like things that reminded me of the states of home so and it was like funny things that I never ate much here growing up like like American candy <laughs> and stuff like that so I think and now that I'm back here, I don't really eat that stuff anymore. So I feel like it what makes me me changes depending on where I am. Yeah, I can resonate with that. Yeah. Ella or, or Romero or Henry, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I could jump in. Cool. Um, so, oh yeah, my name is Henry. And I guess the food, I have a very Americanized dish because I've lived here my entire life. So, um. Oh yeah, because my favorite dishes that everybody knows are like pizza and burgers and like that basic American food. <laughs> but um, yeah, I culturally, I do identify more like as Mexican American for that reason, because like my friends did come from Mexico, but um, the only like the closest connection I've had to like the place over there is to food that they brought with them. So like some foods that they like enjoy eating are like tortas and, um, you know, their beans and their rice. My dad actually taught me a way of like how he ate like rat, like not rice, um, beans and eggs as like a sandwich. There's like this specific way and, you know, just stuff like that. There's also like tamales, um, what's it called, pozole, I love that. Mm, me too. Yeah, especially on like um, during around Christmas. Yeah, that's when they start making like all the warm foods like tamales and pozole. And then, yeah, that's about it. Cool. What do you guys think about that dignity question? Like how can, what are the things that we can think about when we choose our food to make sure that we're not um, taking away someone else's dignity? I was kind of confused on like the way they worded the question because like depending on the context how can you like maintain someone's dignity when it comes to food? I think they're thinking about the conditions that workers involved in producing that food are in. Um, if we're talking about from that sense I guess like just not taking that for granted, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's really hard, isn't it? Because you, you never really know when you go to the grocery store where something's come from and like who's been involved in producing it. Mm -hmm. I guess as long as like we can recognize where they come from, like whether these farms, these people are working hard and not just like say like, oh, why can't, why isn't this in season? Why can't I get this food when there's some 
maybe something in the background going on that's causing that. Yeah. Or maybe like one way to, I mean, it's more expensive, but if, if you can afford it and when you can afford it, you know, choosing organic is good, not just because there's pesticides on the food that we eat, but because for the people who work in the fields, they're being exposed to that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's one way to help ensure. Oh, we have to leave our breakout room now. <laughs> Great. Okay, we'll we'll begin. I think people are still trickling in <clears throat> uh, from the breakout rooms. Mark, is yeah. are all the breakout rooms closed? Yeah, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks. So we're going to go ahead and uh, pick up where we left off, and um, so I'm going to hand it back to uh, Professor Garcia. And if you have some questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, and we're going to have some time at the end. Um, to, to also to address some of the questions that you might have. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to you, Matt. Great. So I'm gonna share my screen again. There we go. There we go. So it was interesting. I really enjoyed the breakout. We were just talking about uh, Menudo. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, there was um, conversation about how uh, Asian um, people also eat the lining of a uh, cow's stomach the way Mexican people do. And so that is sort of the magic of Southern California, in which um, you can get what you need, uh, maybe at a Chinese market as opposed to a Mexican market. And if you're closer to a Mexican market, then there's often that opportunity to get what you need, right? And so what I'm posing here is that these are the sort of unintended gifts or consequences of free trade. In fact, with regards to meat, just briefly, I'll uh, share with you that um, there is a kind of flow of um, what we call offal, which is the innards of the uh, cow, back to Mexico. Um, and then uh, the flow of uh, like the cuts that are familiar to Euro-Americans, uh, such as a ribeye coming north to, to the United States. Um, and that is a consequence of the reduction of tariffs um, and trade, a uh, cost of doing trade across the border. Again, unintended consequences, I think, of NAFTA that really are able to serve uh, different markets and, and mobile communities um, on either side of the border. But of course, it raises a question, as I'm saying, what was intended, right, by NAFTA? And let me go forward here. Okay. Well, what was intended was to replace the kind of uh, system that my grandmother participated in, where she was migrating um, throughout Central California, picking figs, picking cotton, picking um, uh, citrus, picking uh, anything that was grown um, and uh, because there was a notion that, um, in fact, that land was uh, maybe too valuable to use it that way, um, there was also a notion that the, uh, um, the labor was too expensive and that the, um, the, the production needs to go where the laborers are. And in fact, there's some truth to that is that um, Mexican people in particular um, are agricultural people. They are people that, uh, uh, know what to do um, with a cow, for example. So for example, where I'm living right now, we are a very heavy dairy state, and I'll get to that um, at the end of the talk, but Vermont is a very heavy dairy state. And in fact, many of the workers that make the dairy industry go in Vermont are migrants 
uh, from Mexico and Guatemala because they have a familiarity with livestock agriculture, right? So the logic in some ways of NAFTA was to try to move the agriculture where the expertise is. Um, and I think what that requires us to do is to always keep our minds and our attention on um, how food is produced, who's doing the labor to make that food available. And that's just a, a, a kind of modest point that I've made um, throughout my studies of, of food and food history. It used to be that there was always a kind of celebration of food history through the experience and the eyes of the chef, um, who is almost always Euro-American, was um, and, and the people that worked in the kitchen were almost always unsung and were Latino or Asian. Um, and that I think uh, changes when we start to look at the ways in which meals and food is produced in our society. Um, that if we don't segregate out the agriculture, we don't segregate out the kitchens um, and the sous chefs, we, are, we begin to see uh, the, the different people that make the food of, uh, available and, and to um, create the uh, flavors that we think is essential to us as, as a people. But um, in the case of our modern day uh, system, we live with a consequence of um, NAFTA as well. The, the, the ways in which people are displaced by these regimes, which are often referred to as neoliberalism. Um, there's a market logic um, behind uh, the reduction of um, trade barriers. And that is uh, in terms of what they're trying to, to achieve, what is the stated intent of, of free trade. That is to um, uh, bring production to uh, the place where we think expertise is uh, and to, uh, to some extent equalize um, or distribute, distribute um, wealth production on either side of the border. The problem with NAFTA was that it was heavily influenced by um, US corporations and well-placed uh, farm lobby that was always interested in lowering the cost of labor. So while the stated purpose was uh, to increase um, production where the workers are and to elevate the Mexican economy, um, the reality was that it was displacing uh, the Mexican worker and forcing them to go north or even to migrate within Mexico. So we actually have people that are migrating from farms in Yucatan or Oaxaca to Baja California, um, where they become slaves and they start working and creating, uh, um, harvesting uh, uh, strawberries that are consumed in California, right? Um, because there is no regulation now in, in those um, situations. Um, eventually, what happens is that um, these workers who might leave the Yucatan or Oaxaca to Baja California, ultimately realize that even if the conditions are not ideal, the pay is much better still north of the border. So the kinds of uh, migrations that we see are a consequence of um, little regulation of the kind of uh, farms that are going on in Mexico, but also this, the other uh, consequence, which is the undermining of the Mexican economy and the farms that many Mexican farmers made their living from, right? So one of the ways in which Mexican people are known uh, as is that they're known as the corn people. You think about tamales, you think about um, um, tortillas, you think about um, atol, and you think about the things that um, are really ele elemental to being Mexican. And one of the things that free trade did was to create a market for subsidized corn that is being produced in the United States. Um, the farm lobby was one that was always looking for a place to sell its product. And in fact, um, by the year 2003, where this uh, article comes from, Washington Post, uh, Mexico was now importing more than a quarter of the corn it consumed from the United States. And that represented nearly a fourfold surge in uh, since NAFTA took effect nine years before. 
Um, speaking to the Mexican uh, worker who um, was once a uh, farmer who farmed corn, but now had to go on the migrant trail and cross the border, um, he ended up um, reporting to the Washington Post. He said, uh, what is my dream for the future? I want corn prices to be high again so I can go back to Mexico to farm, but I don't know if that will happen. Um, so what in it, it ends up happening because of NAFTA is, is the undermining of the very existence that Mexican people were most capable of, of making a living at, which was farming. Where is their, their best opportunity to make a, a, a living with the, that knowledge? Sometimes it's in California, sometimes it's in the dairies of Vermont, for example, right? And they're forced to migrate. So instead of uh, uh, equalizing um, wealth and distributing jobs and investments where they need to be, it actually undermined the ability for Mexican people to stay where they are and to do the things that make them who they are and to feed themselves the way they see themselves needing to be fed. And the response uh, that the United States had to this migration was to crack down on it, right? The reaction was um, that this is a, a problem. Um, it's not a problem that we created uh, and we want to stop uh, or discourage this migration by passing increasingly uh, punitive legislation. So at the same time that this was happening, um, the Clinton administration, which is a Democratic uh, um, administration, Bill Clinton, and, and his uh, Attorney General Janet Reno passed Operation Gatekeeper to try to slow this migration that was created by NAFTA. And if you know anything about migration in the early 2000s, you know that the deaths in the desert really spiked. And that was where I was um, through uh, this period when I was teaching at Arizona State, where we were watching an uh, increasing number of people crossing through the deserts because they had to, because they could not uh, live with dignity, they could not um, engage in the food systems in Mexico that were created by NAFTA, um, and they had to go north to places where their uh, knowledge and their skills still had purchase and still could get a much better um, uh, wage. And the United States response was to force them further into the desert by militarizing the border zones or the, the, um, the passages such as in, in Tijuana um, or uh, uh, Nogales or El Paso, right? And so that's the period in which we see massive deaths happening uh, in this period. And it has, it's very much tethered to the undermining of the food systems in Mexico that I just showed you. So I want to end by just share, sharing with you how um, these kinds of situations actually reverberate throughout the entire United States. Um, and they're accelerated by um, an event that had nothing to do with Mexico or with Latin America, and that was 9-11, right? So on 9-11, the attacks on New York City, um, there was the response of a brand new homeland uh, security that was created and the um, institution of a monitoring zone that spanned first 25 miles from the border of the United States and then further in 100 miles into the United States. And it went around the entire country, right? Um, this was a period of time also in which um, customs um, and um, and it's a uh, customs and border uh, protection is or C CBP is is um, traveling these areas, and you're getting increased checkpoints that are forcing uh, many of the migrants that are coming to do food work um, into shadows and into deserts and creating the kind of death that I've just explained. For us in Vermont, where I sit right now we exist within that 100 mile zone. And so, uh, and that zone is uh, uh, near Quebec, the Canadian border, right? 
But in spite of the fact that we are far away from what we see as the border that needs to be regulated, the border that is infamous for people dying in the desert, the, the border that is um, infamous for harassment of immigrants, that same harassment happens for Latinos that are working in the dairy industry in Vermont that I just described, right? Because we have the border per, uh, patrol traveling throughout our neighborhoods and capturing uh, uh, dairy workers. They're simply trying to contribute to the economy and contributing to the food that makes Vermont special. So think about Ben and Jerry's, for example, which is um, proudly one of Vermont's uh, uh, biggest uh, um, foods or, or um, industries that defines the state and defines New England. Well, it's dependent on mostly undocumented Latino workers who are put in harm's way by the kind of surveillance that has come first by NAFTA and then by um, September 11th. So what's happening today? Well, many of you probably would say, well, where is the United Farm Workers um, and Cesar Chavez's organization and Dolores Huerta's organization that was supposed to make things better for farm workers in the 1960s and 70s? Yes, to some extent they succeeded and I've read a book about that, but their biggest problem was they were mostly anti-immigrant. They were um, absolutely for supporting resident citizen farm workers and building a union in which only people that have that uh, um, uh, privilege can actually participate in, in the union. Eventually, Cesar Chavez um, really backs away from that position, but the legacy of that position made many of these new migrants that came in doing this work during NAFTA and continuing to today, um, very suspicious of, of that organization. And what it necessitated was new farm worker organizations to rise up and to kind of redefine what farm worker activism is today. So the, a good example are three here. Um, I talk about uh, PACUN in, called Pineros y Campesinos Unidos Noroeste, which is an organization in Oregon. Um, there's the uh, Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida. And then there's Migrant Justice here in Vermont. And I think the main thing that these organizations do that are different from UFW is that they embrace the, the belief that workers are have dignity and have worth regardless of their undocumented status. What we need to see is they are defining um, America and they are defining the industries that make places like Vermont um, a, a, a destination for ice cream, for example, by migrants labor by the work that migrants do, regardless of their documented status. And so one of the things that the, uh, these organizations all have in common is they embrace undocumented workers and they start with the issue of how do we make these people feel comfortable and safe in their work environments? They don't ask questions about undocumented or documented, right? And in many ways, the first thing they do is they address the issues of how they uh, get their papers in order. Um, or how they navigate um, a Byzantine immigration system here, um, how they defend themselves when they end up in uh, CPB, CBP's uh, uh, hands. So all of these things are, are things that these organizations are doing. I would not call them unions per se, and they don't call themselves unions. Um, what they do see themselves as, as immigrants rights organizations first. And I think that's really the key issue if we're going to have justice in our food system and in our farm labor system today. So let me end with this challenge and this question. Um, and that is, how do we embrace an, the enhancements of our uh, food culture, our cuisine without contributing to the suffering of those um, that, our food, that, that make our food possible, right? And what can we do to increase the positives in this food system and eliminate the negatives? So we're not going to change the fact that we are dependent, we are wed to um, that pozole or that menudo. We're not going to change the fact that um, Angelino culture is a uh, food culture is a place that embraces 
yum and embraces mangoes and embraces dragon fruit as essential ingredients to who we are as a multicultural society today. But how do we do that without uh, harming the people whose hands that, that food uh, uh, passes through to make it to our markets and to make it to our plates? And so I leave you with that challenge. I think for me, it's supporting those organizations that I, I talked about, but I'll stop there and then um, take some questions or some comments. All right, thank you, Dr. Garcia. Folks, this is a really good chance to ask some questions. We have a couple of minutes here. So if you have any questions, Marjorie, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask. Am I unmuted? I can't tell. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, and I just lost the picture. But I am, um, at. I was sharing, at 15, I uh, started with, I was part of a, a group called Kennedy Action Corps after Robert Kennedy died. And we did support, I mean, from, I'm from uh, Northern California, and we started um, supporting Cesar Chavez. Um, and I'm talking at 15, and we worked in the boycott. But what I'm saying is there a way to wed the rights that a union can bring and the rights of, um, the human rights of these organizations you're talking about. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to bring them together to do maximum good? Yes, yeah, so these organizations have taken the good from UFW and left out the bad. Um, so one of the goods that they've taken from the UFW is um, consumer activism. Um, so UFW was extraordinary in engineering the boycott to bring justice to grape workers, as you probably know. Right. Yeah. And one of the ways in which, for example, Coalition of Immokalee Workers has brought justice to tomato workers in Florida mm -hmm. is through a boycott of fast food uh, um, restaurants like Taco Bell or Wendy's to get one penny per every uh, tomato that's used in their food. And what do they do with that penny after they accumulate it? Right. And it ends up being thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. They've built an organization that monitors um, work conditions in fields in, in, in Florida so that we don't have the kind of slavery that you found at the beginning of NAFTA that I was talking about briefly. And you'll probably hear more about or see from David Bacon tomorrow, right? So Coalition of Mockley Workers, they call it the Fair Food Program. And they set the agenda um, and Migrant Justice in Vermont has followed suit by creating a similar program by taking uh, pennies coming from the sale of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And Ben and Jerry's has, has agreed to, has embraced the monitoring of their production sites for humane treatment of workers, right? So I think that's where I, 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 I always encourage people to, to look to do justice, is to support these new organizations to know about them because we are still in many ways in a fog about the UFW and what was achieved by, by Cesar Chavez. The fact is that it, it, the, the problems and the ills that existed in his day did not uh, get resolved and actually got worse with NAFTA. Does anybody else wanna ask a question? We might have time for one more. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, again, the, you could unmute and clap or you could just put the clap emoji. But let's all thank uh, Matt for joining us today. Keep in mind, it's about to be seven o'clock where he is. That's why it's, uh, it's a little darker in his space than ours, right? So Matt's joining us from the East Coast, from Vermont. Um, so he, we're just thrilled that he was able to, to join us and do this, this talk and help us think about the politics of our food and, and the sort of human impact that uh, the food that we eat has on, um, on labor and um, members of our community. We're gonna continue this discussion tomorrow and we're gonna be joined by um, <clears throat> a labor activist, a photographer named David Bacon. David's going to do a talk, but he's also gonna frame his talk with some amazing photos that he took. So you're gonna get a chance to analyze his photos, think about the photos, ask some questions, and he's gonna to talk to you about his experiences and his perspective on this topic. 
right? Uh, we're going to put the evaluation right now in the chat. We really appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much for the feedback yesterday. It really helps us think about how we can make these, um, how we can continue to do the good and improve upon the things that you think we should be improving upon. So your, your feedback is really valuable there. So um, with that, I think we're going to sign off. If you have any questions that you want to ask us um, as we wrap up, feel free to stick around. And, uh, you know, myself and Tani will be here for a few minutes if you have any questions that you'd like to ask.